I hope you may have obtained one of these cards on which the plan of our Sunday services and Wednesday evenings is printed out. I was amazed to find somebody last Sunday evening who had never even known that we had such cards. I thought I had uh, made them available widely. You will find that in that card this morning our text is 1 Peter 3.15 and our theme in the general subject of knowing Christ is the particular theme of knowing Christ as the indwelling Lord. Our purpose as we turn to 1 Peter 3 again this morning is very simply in the words that the Apostle Paul used as he prayed for his Ephesian Christian brothers and sisters that you might come to know Christ better. Now as we turn to this particular verse, let's bow for a moment in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we wait upon you and seek your wisdom and the enlightening ministry of your Holy Spirit that he make you, may, may make your word live to us, clarify its truth, empower the written word that it may become the sword of the Spirit in our lives today. For Christ our Savior's sake. Amen. I think that most Christian people who were converted in adult years can probably look back upon some particular truth of the Christian gospel which touched them in a special way and meant something very particular to them at that time and probably since. It may have been the glorious reality of the forgiveness of sins. It may have been the astonishing depth of the love of God in sending His only begotten Son to bear our sin and all the shame and sorrow that He took to Himself on Calvary. It may be that it was the astonishing fact that salvation is by free grace and a gift from God and not the result of anything that I can do. There are all manner of things that unquestionably grip us, one of them in a peculiar way perhaps at the time when we are being drawn to Christ. I would have no difficulty whatsoever in telling you what it was that stood out and riveted itself upon my mind in the period when I began to read the Bible and to begin to grasp the Christian gospel and have my eyes opened to its truth. It was the fact to me quite overwhelming that the eternal God who had made the heavens and the earth and who dwelt in inaccessible glory had redeemed me by the blood of His Son in order that He might come and inhabit me, make my life His dwelling. Make my heart his temple. I found it an altogether astonishing and overwhelming thing to be presented with as one of the basic truths of the Christian faith. I could understand God, I think, dwelling in the glory of heaven surrounded by angels and archangels. I could understand him 
even condescending to dwell in the temples that people like Solomon made. I think I could even have grasped the idea that he might come and make himself known and make his presence real in a company of his people like this in the 20th century. But the idea that he had saved me in order to make my life his habitation, that he had redeemed me in order to dwell in this particular heart, I found that something that really blew my mind. And yet it was precisely this that I began to read in the Bible. I began to read, for example, the Apostle Paul saying to the Galatians, I live, yet not I, it is Christ who lives in me. Or to the Colossians, it is Christ. Christ in you, who is the hope of glory. I read of the Lord Jesus Christ saying to his disciples in the upper room, If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and my Father will love you, and I and my Father will come and make our home with you. Now I found that altogether overwhelming. But in 1 Peter 3.15, which is our text this morning, as you'll see from the card, Peter urges the scattered, suffering Christian believers to whom he writes to have this truth of Christ in your hearts as the great antidote to fear and uncertainty and insecurity. Listen to how he puts it from verse 13. Who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, and they were a company of Christian people under a great deal of pressure. They were suffering in many different ways. Even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear what they fear. Do not be frightened, he quotes from Isaiah 8. But in your hearts set apart Christ as Lord. Now, I want this morning, as it were, to try to put this verse and this truth under the microscope, so to speak, in the hope that God will help us to know more of Christ as the indwelling Lord. And as we do so, there are three things I think we can identify that Peter is speaking about in this particular verse. We can first of all identify the person of whom he speaks when he says, in your hearts set apart Christ as Lord. It is indeed the very Christ of whom we have been thinking on these successive Sunday mornings, the eternal Son of God, the promised anointed Messiah, the obedient servant of Jehovah, the sufficient Savior of His people. It is this Christ, who existed before the world began and came in the fullness of time to be the revelation of God and the Savior of men and women, it is this one of whom Peter says he is to be set apart 
in our hearts. So it is the Christ of God. That is the very Christ we are eager to get to know better in these Sundays. It is He of whom Peter is speaking, who is to be set apart in the hearts of believers. But you will notice that he has given another title to identify him more fully. Not just the title of Christ, but the title of Lord. In your hearts set apart Christ as Lord. Now, that word is one of the commonest words in the New Testament. I'm told by people who discover these things, and I've often wondered how they discover them, that it occurs over 700 times in the New Testament. I have got the peculiar kind of mind that immediately imagines somebody sitting down and going through all of these numbers of times the word occurs, but it is significant that it does occur, and I'm grateful to people who tell me. It is significant that it occurs so frequently. It's one of the commonest words in the New Testament. <clears throat> it carries the idea of authority and supremacy. It speaks to us about one who is to be obeyed by others. Hence, Jesus says to his disciples, Why do you call me? Lord, Lord, and do not do the things that I say. Because the very title carries the idea of authority and superiority and implies that his words, the Lord's words, will be obeyed. Lordship implies obedience and submission. And there is no doubt whatsoever that to set apart Christ as Lord in our hearts means giving Him absolute obedience. It means that in our hearts Peter is urging upon his fellow Christian believers. One of the key secrets of Christian living is that Christ will dwell in our hearts as undis. Lord. There will be no higher authority. There will be no stronger will than His will. He is to be undisputed Lord, and it clearly means that. But there is equally no doubt that in this particular verse the word Lord means more than that. And we need to grasp this more that Peter is clearly implying if we are to understand what it means to set apart Christ as Lord in our hearts. For this verse depends, as I was hinting to you earlier, depends heavily on Isaiah chapter 8 verses 12 and 13. And Peter is there applying... Isaiah's words about Jehovah Almighty to Christ. You can get the direct quotation at the end of verse 14 of 1 Peter 3. Do not fear what they fear. Do not be frightened. Now listen to Isaiah 8 verse 12, the end. Do not fear what they fear and do not dread it. The Lord Almighty is the one you are, to fee uh, you are to regard as holy. He is the one you are to fear. He is the one you are to dread. And He will be a sanctuary. Now, Peter is taking up these words from Isaiah, and he is applying them to Christ. But you will notice that in Isaiah he is speaking of Jehovah Almighty. That is the covenant holy name of God. 
He says, the Lord Almighty is the one you are to fear. He will be a sanctuary for you. But the significant thing is that Peter is taking the word for Jehovah Almighty, the Lord, as you read it in our Old Testament with capital letters, and he is applying it to Christ. Now, the word Lord is used something like 6,000 times in the Old Testament in Greek to translate the holy name of God, Jehovah. And what Peter is here doing is taking a quotation from the prophecy of Isaiah and applying the word for Jehovah to Christ. And he says, in your hearts, set apart Christ as Lord. Now that is what makes this whole concept of the person Peter focuses our attention upon so astonishing. Because you see, this is the Lord in all His glory who appeared in the temple to Isaiah, before whom Isaiah trembled and found the ground heaving beneath his feet. The very angels could not look upon him they held their wings over their eyes because of his blinding glory. And Peter takes up this very word used for that glorious God and says, set apart Christ as Lord in your hearts. Because that is who He is. He is the eternal God, the infinitely Holy One, Jehovah of hosts. And He is the one who is in your hearts. Have you really begun to grasp this, my dear friends? Have you grasped what this means? When we sing, Christ lives in me, and we are almost casual about the idea. How in God's name can you be casual when the thrice holy God who caused the heavens and the earth to be made, before whom the angelic hosts veil their faces, lives in you. Now that leads me to the second thing that you can perceive if you put this text under the microscope. Not only the person on whom he focuses but the location in which this person is to be found. In your hearts, that is the hearts of these weak, frail, suffering believers, frequently failing, recognizing their weakness, that they were simple clay. In your hearts, he says, set apart Christ as Lord. I wonder if you remember the problem Solomon had when he built his temple. It wasn't the problem of where he would get the materials from. It wasn't the problem of getting workmen to work hard enough. The problem he had with his temple was this. The only thing that mattered about a temple that Solomon or anybody else might build for God 
was that God might inhabit it. That was the thing that mattered. Because the existence of the temple was only significant if God was to come down and make his habitation there. And Solomon expressed the problem in these words. He prayed and said, Heaven and the heaven of heavens cannot contain you. How much less this house that I have built. Now, it was a place of remarkable glory. Solomon's temple was something out of this world. And you might have thought if there was any place on earth where God might have been pleased to dwell, it would have been there. But he said, heaven, and the heaven of heavens cannot contain you, how much less this house that I have built. But here Holy Scripture is telling us that that same eternal God whom heaven cannot contain is in the person of his only Son, making redeemed human flesh his temple. Do you not know, says the Apostle, that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? And it is in your heart that he dwells. Now it could be that some of you are saying, but isn't that the point? Is it not the Holy Spirit who indwells the believer? Is it not inaccurate to say that Christ indwells the believer? Isn't the whole purpose of the Holy Spirit's coming that he indwells the believer. Not Christ, but the Holy Spirit. Now, that's a good question. But it only gets nine out of ten. For two reasons. One is, you can never you may never divide the persons of the Holy Trinity from one another. They are indivisible, and therefore we may not think of the Holy Spirit apart from Christ, and Christ apart from the Father, or the Spirit apart from the Father. They are indivisible. And where the Holy Spirit is, the whole Godhead is there. But the more important reason is that Scripture actually speaks to us of Christ indwelling the believer, not only in the passages that I've mentioned, in John 14 and Galatians 2 and Colossians 1, but also in Ephesians chapter 3 at the end, where the Apostle Paul prays for the people of God at Ephesus, that God may strengthen you, Ephesians 3:16 with power through His Spirit in your inner being. That is the Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And then at the end of that passage, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God, so he is speaking not only about the Holy Spirit ministering everything of Christ to us, but Christ dwelling 
within us. Now, of course, it is true that Christ, the incarnate Son of God, is at the right hand of the Father this morning with His glorified flesh. And it is by the Holy Spirit that He indwells the believer. But clearly, Scripture wants to press upon us that it is this very Christ by the Holy Spirit who is Himself the eternal Son, the promised Messiah, the obedient servant, the sufficient Savior. It is the Christ who is Himself very God of very God. It is He who dwells in the heart of the simplest frailest, weakest, neediest child of God. You can begin to see then why it is that Peter brings this to the believers to whom he writes as an antidote to fear and insecurity. Do not, he says, fear what they fear. Do not be frightened, but set apart in your hearts Christ as Lord. And then who in God's name can be against you? For your heart is the dwelling place of the eternal God. Your heart is a sanctuary for Him, and He will be a sanctuary for you. That's what He's saying. But here's the third thing that becomes apparent as we put this verse under the microscope. Not only the person of whom he is speaking and the location where this person is to be found, but there is an exhortation laid upon Christians in view of Christ's indwelling. And you will note that it's in these two little words, in your hearts set apart Christ as Lord. Now, in some versions, the words set apart are translated as sanctify. It means to regard with awe and worship. It is, in fact, the same word that we use in the Lord's Prayer when we pray, Hallowed be thy name. We are saying, Your name is holy, our Father. Your name is holy, and we long that it might be honored and your glory manifested in the world. So Peter urges us, let Christ be set apart as Lord of lords in your heart, in a place of solitary glory. There is none other in the entire universe to whom you will give such honor and glory as to Him. He will be loved with a love that has no equal. He will be exalted to a place where He has no rival. He will be honored and trusted in a way that has no parallel. That is how Christ will be set apart in the heart of the believer. And our hearts will become that kind of sanctuary. And when people see the manifestation of this in our lives, they will most certainly say, I wonder who lives there.
for that is what the heart of the believer is to be like. This is where Christ makes his home. You see? That's the amazing thing that Jesus says to the disciples in the upper room. I and my Father will come and make our home with the one who loves me and keeps my commandments. We will be at home there. Do you know what it is sometimes to go into somebody's house and you say, Oh, I just feel so much at home here. Is Christ at home in your heart this morning, my Christian brother and sister? Is Christ really at home there because your heart has become the kind of sanctuary where he is worshipped and honored and loved and adored and obeyed? He is in a place of solitary glory. And then you will have the answer to all manner of fear and insecurity and despair because there dwells in you the eternal Son of God, the creator of the ends of the earth, to whom all power and authority belongs. And we really need to go about our daily business saying, wherever I am, wherever I go, my life is the palace for the King of Kings. Any Christian who ever felt insignificant gets it cured there. Let's pray together. Our Father, our minds cannot begin to contain the amazing truth that you have made your people your habitation. I delight to dwell with those who are of a humble and contrite heart. O oh God, make our lives a sanctuary for Christ. Make our hearts a temple for him. And grant that men and women in the world around us may recognize who lives there. We ask it for his name's sake. Amen.